Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's program is the recent launch of the Lucy mission to the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter. And here to tell us all about it is our own NASA Solar System Ambassador, John McGill. So, John, tell our viewers about this mission. Hi, Don. Yeah, um, Lucy launched on October 16, 2021, and she launched on a Atlas V-401 rocket on her 12-year uh, mission to Jupiter's Trojan asteroids. The Atlas rockets uh, have numbers, like the Atlas V and then another series of numbers. What do those uh, numbers mean, John? Oh, that's a good question, Don. Okay, here you can see the full uh, rocket. So that's Lucy up on the top, and uh, it's called an Atlas uh, V. That means it's the fifth version of the Atlas rocket. And on the top, you see the fairing, and that's uh, a four-meter fairing, and thus the number four in the 401. And zero means that there are zero solid rocket boosters on the side. And the one means that it has one um, engine for the upper Centaur stage. Well, I hear the Atlas V is is being retired. Oh, yeah, it is. Um, but it's got 27 more missions to go. And it's already gone up 90, uh, taken 90 missions up into orbit. So it is a workhorse. But what the problem is, is that... Uh, it's using a Russian engine, uh, main engine on the booster. And basically, um, the politicians, they didn't like that. So they wanted the American engine. So they got together with ULA and they uh, developed a new booster or rocket that they're going to call the Vulcan. And that's um, with Blue Origin. And it's going to be a methane-propelled uh, engine, methane and liquid oxygen. Okay, because didn't the uh, Atlas Vs, don't they use uh, kerosene since it's a Russian engine? Kerosene or RP-1, that's uh, the main fuel for almost all rockets. Uh, I mean, a lot of them have it. And it's been that way since uh, World War II and a little before that when they first started building rockets. But it's... Uh, you know, a little bit uh, dirtier and uh, methane, that's going to be a real clean fuel. So it's going to be ecologically uh, friendly. Good to know. Okay, here we got um, where it's going. So it's going to these two green swarms. And these are the asteroids or the Trojan asteroids that are in the L4, which is preceding Jupiter in its orbit. And L5 is following Jupiter. So here you can see about... Uh, how they're going. And you, you can see that these asteroids, they're pretty stable in uh, the, their positions. Now, isn't Lucy the first spacecraft to visit them? Yeah, um, it is going to be the first one that's going to eight different uh, asteroids, and it is the first to go to Jupiter's Trojan asteroids. So I'm, I'm wondering, how did Lucy get its name? Oh, that's that's a good question. It's named after the fossil uh, that Donald Johansson uh, discovered, and it's basically the oldest uh, fossil that we've found of a human, uh, well, a human type uh, person. Let me play a video. Oh, what an honor to have Donald Johansson here with me today. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. You know, you have to take me back to that day when you discovered Lucy in Ethiopia back in 1974. Tell me how you found her. Well, it's amazing. It'll be 50 years since that discovery, wow. two years from now. I was a young anthropologist. I was searching in the extreme northeast of Ethiopia for looking for remains of our human ancestors. I glanced over my shoulder one day. I saw a little piece of bone, recognized it as belonging to a human skeleton, wow. and it led to Lucy. And Lucy has become the benchmark by which all discoveries are judged. That's amazing, just to see over the shoulder, like how did you pick the small piece of bone out from from all around you? Well, you know, when you're out there, you train your eye. And you know how we always say you look, you find something in the last place you look? Well. That's sort of like what happened. Oh, I, my gosh. I carry these images in my mind of bones and teeth and so on. And when I saw that elbow, 
piece of elbow. I knew it couldn't be from a baboon, it couldn't be from an antelope, and from all the work I had done in graduate school, I knew that it had to come from a human ancestor. And why did you name her after the Beatles song? Well, I thought it was a female because of the very small size of the bones. And okay. we thought, well, is this a child? No, the third molars were erupted, the wisdom teeth, as we call them today. And that night in camp, in the middle of nowhere, when we were celebrating her discovery, someone was, we were listening to a Beatles tape, uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was playing, and someone said, why don't you just call her Lucy? And that was it. You could not go back and call her anything else. No, that I became love that name. name. Yeah. So like Lucy, whose skeletal skeleton provided unique insight into human evolution, NASA's Lucy mission hopes to provide that same insight into the Trojan asteroids, and they are considered fossils of our solar system. Studying Jupiter's Trojan asteroids up close about, or should help scientists hone their theories on how our solar system planets formed four and a half billion years ago. So can you tell us a little bit about the history of how and, and when the mission started? Yeah, sure. Uh, Lucy was uh, in someone's head until about 2014. And then in 2014, there was another engineer and he was working on a software program on trajectories. And he was reading about uh, the Lucy mission that was going to two asteroids at that time. And he started running his program on the trajectories. And what he was doing, taking two hours, was taking the original program that uh, the Lucy team was using at that time, 10 months to do. So in a short time, he was able to come up with a much better approach uh, to the asteroid. And it saved NASA time, and it, they were able to use a smaller rocket, which saved money. And then they also were able to go to five more asteroids. So they were going to seven Trojan asteroids and plus uh, one main belt asteroid. So with all the cost savings, NASA gave it the go ahead. And so in 2017, uh, they started actually prepping and building the rocket. So how can you argue with less cost and more productivity, right? Yeah, that's it's hard to argue with the, those points. So Lucy's on its way, right? Yeah, she's on its way, but... Uh, before it launched, um, ULA has a famous command, and it's kind of like uh, the command in auto racing, where you hear um, drivers start your engines. Well, Lucy has, <laughs> Lucy has, uh, or ULA has, go Atlas, go Centaur, go Lucy. 25 seconds. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go, Lucy. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. Atlas V takes flight, sending Lucy to uncover the fossils of our solar system. Tower clear. So here's uh, one of my images from that night. And this, uh, I like this one because it shows all the uh, frost and, yeah, the ice build up, you know, from the rocket engines, uh, boosters being fueled and topped off. And, uh, you know, here you can see a little bit of the ice crystals coming off. And this one I took and it was for, about four miles away from uh, the launch pad. That's quite a telephoto lens you got there. Yeah, it, it does really come in, you know, brings everything up close. So here we are. Uh, I wanted to show this um, before I show you the next picture, because this shows you where I was at. I'm on the left over there where the blue dot is on the, with that yellow line. And that's at the time clock. And I'm looking due east over the pad and then out into the ocean. And that's the same trajectory that uh, Lucy took. 
So normally when we have one going to a rocket going to the space station, it'll go on a northeast trajectory and the most other solar system um, missions they end up going on a southeast trajectory. So this one was kind of different in that it went straight away from us. So here you can see in this picture, this one, this is a time-lapse uh, photo. So it took five minutes to take this image. But what's strange about this or different than normal streak shots, as we call them, is that if you think of the rocket, it goes, well, let me put it this way. It goes up like this, then it hits its uh, high point, and then it starts following the horizon, and it actually goes down until it drops into the water where you think it was crashing but it's so far beyond there it's going around the earth so in this one if you turn your hand it's going up like this then it's going over and it crests and it's coming back down but it's lined up so perfectly that you don't see it coming down all you see it is going up so that's what i liked about this one interesting shot yeah, and the clouds really adds a lot to it where it gives you, you know, just that little bit to make this uh, look spectacular because it's, you know, punching through the cloud and coming out the other side. Okay, now Lucy's, uh, let's take a look at the path of Lucy. Lucy. Lucy starts out here where it's in its parking orbit and then it comes out of the parking orbit and it starts heading out to meet its first asteroid which is Donald Johansson. That's the fellow who discovered the, the Lucy fossils. Yeah, that's right, Don. Uh, what happened was when they figured out they were going to go by this uh, asteroid in the main belt, it was only a number at the time, and they thought it only fitting that they give it the name of uh, Donald Johansson. Okay, after it goes by Donald Johansson, it starts to hit the L4 asteroids. And here it hits Euripides and uh, Keta and Ptolemya, Lucius and Oris. Then it starts heading back towards the Earth again and gets another gravity assist. And now it's going out to L5. And here at L5, it's going to meet Petutius and Minutius. And at that point, uh, the mission's basically over. Okay, well, you mentioned these uh, Lagrange points, L4 and L5. Uh, could you remind our viewers what those are exactly? Yeah, sure. Lagrange points, uh, L4 and L5, again, they're in front of and behind Jupiter. And when you take a look at this, you can see that it's an equilateral triangle that's between the Sun, Jupiter, and the Lagrange points. And at these points, the L4 and L5, that's uh, the gravity is neutralized between uh, the Sun and Jupiter. So that's why this is uh, a really stable area that these asteroids are in. And they don't usually get bumped out or anything. They're just kind of floating there. And they've been floating since uh, the beginning of the solar system. Well, you were mentioning some of the names of these Trojan asteroids, and they sure sound to me like characters from uh, the story of the Trojan War, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey. But uh, there was one other that I didn't quite catch. Yeah, that was probably Keta. Yeah, that's the one. And, uh, yeah, Keta, that, that was... Um, it was when the Hubble Space Telescope was looking at Euripides and they found that there was a satellite or moon uh, that was orbiting Euripides. And uh, basically all the names from the Iliad were characters from the Iliad were taken up. So uh, they wanted to keep with the Greek uh, theme. And so there was an Olympian, she was the first uh, woman torchbearer to light the cauldron at the Olympics. And um, so as a torchbearer, she was um, a messenger. And that's basically what Euripides was. He, he was a herald. And so um, like Euripides, Keta was um, announced 
or sent the message that the Olympics had started. Yeah, I believe those were the 68 Mexico City Summer Games, if I remember right. Yeah, that, that was it. It was uh, Enriqueta, Keta for short, uh, Basile. And she's got about four other names that go along with that. Um, but I can't pronounce them all, so I just uh, cut it short. Okay, and there she is lighting the cauldron. Okay, let's take a look, closer look at Patroclus and Minutius. And uh, they're a, a binary pair of asteroids that are basically the same mass, and so they orbit each other. But uh, they orbit around the center point, and it's kind of like a dumbbell going around, but without the bar in between them. Okay, so they're orbiting a common center of gravity? Exactly. And again, this is another Hubble Space Telescope picture. And you can see that uh, it's only a few pixels uh, that these asteroids are lighting up. So you can imagine how small they are. Oh, for sure. And they're in that L5 okay. point as well? Yes, that, that was in L5. This has been a really interesting presentation on this new uh, mission that's set out, John. Uh, we'll continue in a moment, but uh, first we need to take a break. If anyone has a question, uh, please send it to our email. Uh, the address, of course, is down at the bottom of your screen. And we'll be right back with part two of this interesting discussion right after we hear from Stephen and Term of the Month. Thanks, Don. The Term of the Month is TLE, the Two-Line Elements Set. In 1965, Max Lane published a paper introducing analytical drag theory for tracking objects in Earth orbit. A two-line format was designed for punched cards and became the NORAD standard model in the early 1970s. Fortran source was published in 1980. Six of the numbers in the format are the six standard numbers used in ephemeris. The inclination, right ascension of the ascending node, eccentricity, argument of perigee, mean anomaly, and mean motion. Other data includes a satellite catalog number, the first and second derivative of the mean motion, and a drag or radiation pressure term. The Lucy spacecraft is 13 meters long and 14 and a quarter meters wide when the twin 7.3 meter diameter solar panels are deployed. With a telescope on a computerized mount, updated ephemeris data may be able to be entered, and maybe you can spot Lucy during any of the three Earth gravity assists. It flies by at 300 kilometers altitude on October 16th, 2022, or 350 kilometers altitude on December 13th, 2024, or 660 kilometers altitude on December 26th, 2030. Don't worry about the math. The computer has it all figured out. And that's the term of the month, TLE, the two-line element set. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen. We're back with John McGill, NASA Solar System Ambassador, and he's telling us all about the recently launched Lucy mission to the Jupiter Trojan asteroids. So, John, take it away. Okay, now, now when we look back on our solar system and our place here on Earth, people often ask, what is our history? How did we get here? Lucy's going to try to help answer some of these questions. And there are a handful of theories explaining planets, moons, and other objects formed and how they formed and ended up in their current locations, such as the Nice model named after the city of France. This computer simulation of the early solar system suggests that the giant gaseous planet started out in a packed configuration around the sun. Eventually, gravitational interactions with the disk of small bodies and with each other caused the growing planets to spread apart. Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn spread out further away from the sun while Jupiter moved slightly closer. In this theory, the reshuffling caused chaotic disruption, scattering many bodies out of the solar system and drawing some in and trapping them around the Lagrange points. And that's one possible explanation for how Jupiter's Trojans came to be. 
Comparing the composition of the Jupiter Trojans will help scientists unravel history from Earth and space telescopes. Trojans look compositionally different from each other. Is that because each came from a different part of the solar system and was thus made of different stuff? Or are the Trojans made of the same stuff with differences visible only on their surfaces, which may have been altered by different degrees of heating, radiation, and collision, collisions the asteroids experience while making their way to their current Lagrange points? Scientists will try to answer these and other co questions with Lucy's suite of instruments. Well, you have the title of the talk is Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Are we looking at the stars as being diamonds? Yeah, I guess you could say that, but Lucy does have an actual 20 carat diamond used in the LTS spectrometer to split light beams. 20 carat diamond, is this real or man made? Yeah, you can keep some of your money in your pocket. It's man made. Now, I know you like to look for hidden messages on these rockets. Uh, did you find any on this mission? Oh, I sure did, Don. You know me. Uh, this first one that I have, it's it was a message to the employees of United Launch Alliance, and it was in recognition of your hard work and dedication shown throughout the pandemic, Lucy Strong. And then there was another uh, couple memorials up above that message, and uh, it started off with one William Billy Joyner and Mark Kaz Kazbuski and they were both uh, ULA team, team members. And then uh, the third one was Craig M. Whitaker, and he was uh, with ULA and the Launch Service Program team. And the little story about him was uh, he started off with the Launch Service Program way at the beginning. And one day he brought his son uh, to work with him, and his son got so excited about seeing what his dad did and the son went on to college and got his engineering degree. And he ended up working with his dad for a short time before his dad passed. And uh, the last one here, this was a gold plaque. It has some of the Beatles uh, lyrics on it, along with um, a poem by Amanda Gorman. And you remember who Amanda Gorman was, don't you? Oh, sure do. She gave the reading at the inauguration back in January. Yeah, very good, Don. <laughs> so Lucy's got a nominal 12-year mission. Um, do you think it could be extended beyond that? Oh, more than likely it will. Um, most of the missions do get extended. If you take a look at New Horizon, uh, that was supposed to go for 10 years, and it's uh, still going strong now And after its launch in 2006. So that's been going for 15 years. And uh, Lucy, they figured out um, a trajectory that um, would take it over 150,000 years before or without it hitting anything. And they just stopped there because they didn't want to continue on. But along with the longevity of the spacecraft, they had to think about uh, the longevity of the engineers here on Earth. And when you think of um, how long some of these members have been uh, with this, um, so say 2014 was when it started, they're, um, you know, pushing along. And so some people that are just being born now will probably work on this mission later on when uh, the people that started it have gone on. And so, you know, people change jobs or retire, but uh, they did um, plan a succession team with the crew. Well, that's, that's a good idea, because like you say, if they can continue certainly beyond 12 and going 20, 30, even 40 years, yeah, you're going to have to have people who are in the loop to uh, still keep managing this program. Well, I'd like to uh, thank our guest, uh, John McGill, Ford Club member and NASA Solar System Ambassador, for bringing us this information on this newly launched program. If you uh, would like to, please check out our website. Uh, the address, as always, is down at the bottom of your screen. And to finish off the show, we'll turn it back to Stephen for What's Up in the Night Sky. Thanks, Don. 
What's up in the night sky for November 2021? The days continue to get shorter in the Northern Hemisphere. We just had Halloween, a cross-quarter day, about halfway between September equinox and the December solstice. The moons start with a new moon on the 4th, first quarter on the 11th, full moon on the 19th, and last quarter on the 27th of November. Now, Mercury has superior conjunction on the 28th, making it very close to the sun all month. Mars is also very close to the sun this month. Now here we see Venus, Pluto, Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, and Uranus. This is on the 1st of November, uh, just after sunset, very close after sunset. Venus goes from Ophiuchus to Sagittarius over the month and sets about two to three hours after the sun does. Pluto is in Sagittarius and sets about an hour or two after that. Saturn and Jupiter are in Capricornus, and they set another hour after that. Neptune is in Aquarius, as usual, and sets two to three hours after that. And Uranus is in Aries, but doesn't really set because it has opposition on uh, November 4th, so it is visible essentially all night long. Of note also is Comet 67P, churyumov gerasimenko famous for the visit by the Rosetta spacecraft. It is closest to the Sun on November 3rd. On November 11th and 12th, the comet is closest to the Earth, about 38 uh, million miles, 61 million kilometers. Despite an orbit around the Sun that only takes 6.43 years, this is the closest it comes to Earth until 2214, another 193 years. It is not a naked eye comet. It will brighten to magnitude 9 or 10. As David Levy says, comets are like cats. They both have tails, and they both do whatever they want. The math suggests that a 45 millimeter telescope is the minimum size in order to see this. 10 by 50 binoculars on a good mount may work. Almost any telescope or photography should work. But remember, dark skies away from city lights and a good sky chart are a must. On, on November 11th and 12th, the comet will be near Pollux, the lower of the two bright stars in Gemini. Slightly south of east at midnight, high in the sky. This stellarium shot faces east at about 11.30 p.m. local time on November 11th. Don't forget to dress warm. And that is What's Up in the Night Sky for November 2021. Remember, we don't charge money for this show, but we may tax your brain.